the obedient sheep of God, are you obedient to the Lord? And are you obedient to his instructions? That is what I ask all of you today. Now, when I read this 10th chapter of John's gospel, a few memories are brought back to mind for me. Now, one of those memories I actually shared with all of you last week. You recall in last week's sermon uh, that I spoke about how I learned very own, uh, very early on to fear my parents, especially when my mom would say to both me and my brother when we would be acting up, when she would say, wait until your dad gets home. Me and my brother, we had to learn right away that it was in our best interest not to be disobedient. I imagine all of you learned that same lesson very early on in your life. That it's best for you to be obedient, especially to your parents. I remember when we used to go to the store and how mom would always say to me and my brother just before we went inside the store, you better not act up. Now, when we got a little older, our parents would let us go a couple hours over from them by ourselves. And to show you just how well trained me and my brother were, my dad, he could clap his hands a couple of times. And me and my brother knew right away that that was his clap. And we knew that it was time for us to immediately make our way over to him. Now, me and my brother, we had our moments just like any other child would when we would act up. But what I would tell all of you today is that we were some pretty obedient kids, I must say, and I hope that she would agree with me on that. Again, we figured out very early on in our lives that it was better for us to be obedient rather than for us to be disobedient and face the punishment or face whatever it is that they would dish out to us. So when I look at this passage of scripture today, I actually smile at the obedience of the sheep here in this passage of script in, in this passage of scripture. I smile in regards to how they follow the shepherd here. Knowing that Jesus was speaking of himself here as the shepherd and those who follow him as the sheep, it makes me consider today our obedience to the Lord. I consider again this question, are we being obedient sheep of the Lord? In my sermon last week, you recall that I remarked how we mankind think of nature being uncontrollable. I stated that we struggle with controlling animals. We very, we barely can control our own pets is what I said last week. Yet we see here in scripture that the shepherd seems to have some sort of control over the sheep. We see here in scripture that the sheep are following the shepherd. Sheep, they are very remarkable animals. And I feel that the Lord often used sheep as an example for how we ought to be in our obedience towards him. Now, what I want to do here for just a moment is I want to dive into the nature of sheep. But I also want to dive into why we should be more obedient to our good shepherd. We'll see here in the opening verses of the 10th chapter of John's gospel. We'll see it say here in the third verse. We'll see how Jesus speaks of how the sheep can recognize the voice of their shepherd. And we also see that not only do the sheep recognize the voice of their shepherd, we see that the sheep will follow him. The sheep will follow the shepherd wherever the shepherd leads them. Now, I want you to understand that this is a very remarkable feat. Now, why is this feat that has been done by man, that has been done for centuries, why do I say that this is such a remarkable feat? 
Well, again, we struggle with controlling wild animals, don't we? Now, in their nature, sheep are very meek animals. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by this is that sheep are animals that aren't violent. Sheep are animals that aren't necessarily strong. Sheep are animals that can be very submissive. This means that they will follow anything or anybody that does not pose a threat to them. Now, one thing I must point out about sheep is this. At the first sign of a threat, at the first sign of danger, whether that is a strange sound, whether that is a strange animal, or even us people, sheep will do one thing. Sheep will flee. They will do their very best to run away from something that poses a dangerous threat to them. You see, this is their very best defense to run away. In order to protect themselves, sheep will flock together with other sheep or with other like cattle, but still again, at the very first sign of danger, the sheep will scatter, the sheep will flee, the sheep will run away. Now we see Jesus speak to this when he says there in the fifth verse, he says, they being the sheep will by no means follow a stranger, Jesus says, but will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. So what I want you to understand here is that shepherds, in order for them to get sheep to follow them, shepherds have to put in some diligent work. Shepherds have to put in a great deal of work to earn the trust, to earn the obedience of the sheep in order to get the sheep to willingly follow behind to get them to willingly follow after him or her. So to do this, shepherds must first prove to the sheep that they are not a threat of danger. So how do they go about doing this? Well, this could all begin with an offer of food. It could begin with them doing this enough times, offering food to the sheep for the sheep to realize that they are not a danger. Sheep could realize that the shepherds aren't trying to harm them. Sheep could realize that the shepherd does not pose a threat to them and may go to the shepherd for a meal. We'll find again that over time, after putting much work in, shepherds will be able to feed the sheep. Shepherds will be able to care for the sheep and shepherds will be able to provide protection to the sheep as well. If you're paying a close attention to this, essentially the shepherd is providing everything that the sheep requires in order for the sheep to be able to live out its life peacefully. Now, one thing I believe that we can take away from all of this in the nature of the sheep is that it is very beneficial for the sheep to trust, for the sheep to obey, for the sheep to be with the shepherd. It is truly a blessing for the sheep because all of their needs are being supplied for by the shepherd. All of their needs are being taken care of by the shepherd. So do we understand, asking all of us today, do we understand that it is good for us to be under the care of the good shepherd? Do you understand today that it is best for you, it is beneficial for you to be under the care of the good shepherd? Now we'll see Jesus say a couple of times here within this passage of scripture in the 11th verse and then in the 14th verse, 
you see that Jesus says a couple of times there that he is the good shepherd. That is one of my favorite facts of Jesus, that he is a shepherd, but not only is he a shepherd, but that he is the good shepherd. Now, I want to point out that all who have lived in the world or all who are living in the world today, those who will live in the world tomorrow, I want to point out that all of us are like cattle. All of us are like cattle that are grazing in the field. We're grazing in a wide open pasture, if you will, that pasture being the world. Many of us, we start out grazing in this pasture. We start out grazing in this field aloof to all that is around us. This is a thought that I have been touching on for months and I've been touching on this thought for years. Many of us, we graze in this field, eating from the field and not knowing what we are eating, not knowing whether it is good for us or not knowing whether it is bad for us. And when I say that we are grazing in this field and that we are eating from the field, I want you to understand that I'm not talking about physical eating. I'm talking about spiritual consumption here. Many of us, we drink water from the field and we don't realize whether the water is good for us or whether it is bad for us. And again, I want you to understand, I'm not talking about physically drinking water. I'm talking about spiritually consuming what we drink. We stand aloof in this field, not even realizing when we are in the presence of danger. So I say to you today that we require a shepherd. Not only do we require a shepherd, we require a good shepherd that will watch over us, that will keep us, and that will care for us while we are grazing in this pasture, while we are grazing in this field that is our world. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say today. Now, I want you to understand this. I want you to understand that God was well aware that we, mankind, would be in the need of a shepherd after man's fall in the garden. Now, I want to direct your attention for a moment to the 21st chapter of Matthew's gospel, starting at the 33rd verse and working through the 40th verse for just a moment here. We'll see that Jesus in that passage of scripture we'll see that he actually describes the Lord's actions for caring for the flock. And we'll see that he does this through a parable that is titled the parable of wicked vine dressers. Again, that's in the 21st chapter of Matthew's gospel, starting at the 33rd verse. 21st. 21st. In that parable, we'll see that Jesus spoke of a certain land owner that planted a vineyard and leased the vineyard to vine dressers. Now I want you to understand in that parable that the landowner is God and that the vineyard that was planted was the world. The vine dressers or the gardeners, if you will, I want you to understand in that passage of scripture were the children of Israel. Now we'll see that Jesus stated there in the 34th verse that when vintage time had come, we'll see that he said that the landowner sent his servants to the vine dressers to receive fruit from the vineyard. We see the children of Israel were supposed to bear fruit. They were supposed to be fruitful, just like how we, as the children of God, we, the genuine believers, we are to bear good fruit, right? We are to be fruitful. And so we see here in this parable that the servants, that they were sent to the vineyard to receive fruit from the vine dressers. Now the servants, I want you to understand in this parable were the prophets who were, who the Lord repeatedly sent to the children of Israel in order to direct them in the way of the Lord so that they could be fruitful, so that they could bear fruit. Now, unfortunately for those servants, 
we'll see it say there in the 35th and the 36th verse that when they arrived to the vineyard, when they met the vine dressers, we are told that they were beat. We are told that they were killed. We are told that they were stoned. That says a lot about the, the vine dressers, the one who were supposed to be bearing good fruit. So in Old Testament days, God sent his prophets to the flock. Again, that flock was the children of Israel. And while some of Israel may have listened to those prophets, ultimately the prophets were rejected. That means that God was rejected by the children of Israel. The flock in this instance, I want you to understand clearly here today, they were rejecting the word of God. Not only were they rejecting the word of God, they were rejecting those that were being sent to watch over them by the Lord. Now I want to direct your attention back to the 10th chapter of John's gospel here. We we'll see Jesus say within this 10th chapter that outside of the servants that God had sent, there were more visitors that came to <laughs> the flock. We we'll see that Jesus said that all those that came before him were thieves and robbers. We'll see that said there in the eighth verse, if you're following along with me. Jesus, I want you to understand when he was speaking of the thieves and robbers here, I want you to understand that he was actually speaking of the religious leaders in his day. The religious leaders were considered thieves and robbers. And I want you to understand that when Jesus spoke of the thief, we'll see him say there in the ninth verse that the thief, the robber came to steal and to kill and to destroy the flock, which we know that the religious leaders were doing in Jesus's day because he often got on them for their being hypocrites and for their teaching and where it was leading the people of Jerusalem. So the thieves and robbers we should understand were there to bring harm to the flock. They were a danger. They posed a threat to the flock. Any of the flock that decided to follow after them, because again, sheep are submissive and they will follow anything or anybody that they feel do not pose a threat to them. Anyone that followed the thieves and the robbers were opening themselves up to danger because we are like sheep. We are susceptible of putting our trust in anything. If we, if we feel it does not pose a threat, if it is not dangerous to us, we have to be very wary of the thieves and the robbers that come into the field while we are grazing. Let us remember that Jesus spoke a word and said, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. This was a warning. This is a warning that we must take very seriously while we graze in this field that is our world. Now, Jesus will see him in this passage of scripture as well, that he tells us of another that came to watch over the flock. But this other one that came to watch over this flock, Jesus tells us was a hireling. This means that this one was hired to actually help watch over, hired to actually care for the sheep. But Jesus says that in the 12th verse, he says of the howling that this one was not the shepherd. In fact, we'll see that the howling did not even really care for the flock there in the 13th verse. We'll see that in the face of danger, we are told that the howling flees and that he leaves vulnerable a flock that is aloof, 
a flock that is already vulnerable itself said that if a wolf came along the way that the howling would run away. They will leave the flock vulnerable to the wolf that desires, we are told in scripture, to catch the sheep. We're told that the wolf is wanting to scatter. It desires to scatter the sheep as well. So of these three people, the thieves, the robbers, the hireling, we see that none of them were good for the flock. We see that none of them were good for the flock and they certainly were not worthy of the trust. They were not worthy of the obedience of the flock. So I, I must ask this question. If you've been following the words that I have said here today, I must ask this question. Why do we give our trust why do we give our obedience to people who are thieves, to people who are robbers, to people who are hirelings? And again, I want you to understand that this question that I'm asking you today, I'm posing to this question to you spiritually. Why are we trusting our soul? Why are we trusting our spirit? to those who are thieves, to those who are robbers, and to those who are hired help. Who are you being obedient to today? Who are you trusting today? Who are you following today spiritually? Again, let us remember that in order for a shepherd to gain the trust and the obedience over his flock, let us remember again that the shepherd must put in some work. Uh, a flock that had already rejected the Lord's servants and had been betrayed by thieves, robbers, and hirelings, that flock would require a great amount of work, wouldn't it? in order for the shepherd to gain their trust, in order for the shepherd to gain their obedience. Now we will find that the Lord was more than willing to step up to the plate and put in the work to earn the trust, to earn the obedience of the flock that it was grazing in the field. We know this because he first sent his servants to the flock. We know this because after that did not work, the Lord personally made a visit to the field in the form of Christ himself. The field, I want you to understand, was not made of simply one flock, but we'll see in the 16th verse there that there was another fold, that there was another flock. And this flock, I want you to understand, was made up of different cattle as well made up of all kinds of sheep as well. And Jesus tells us that the Lord came for that fold as well, that fold being the Gentiles, that fold being the rest of the world. Now to earn the trust of the flocks, in order for the shepherd to put in the work, in order to earn their trust, We'll see that Jesus came in the same manner that the, the cattle that was in the field, he came just as they were. Jesus came meek and he came lowly to the field. He came just like one of us who graze in this field that is our world. This the Lord did to show that he did not pose a threat this God did to show that he was not a danger to all of us who are grazing in this field. In scripture, we'll see that Jesus declared that he did not come to destroy the law, but that he came to fulfill the law. Jesus did not come to destroy anything. Jesus came for the purpose of saving. Jesus came for the purpose of helping all of us who graze in the field. 
Yeah, this means that Jesus came to give the flock an opportunity at life. We see Jesus said himself there in the 10th verse. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it, it being life, that they may have it more abundantly. That is what Jesus said there. Now to prove even more that he was not like those that came before him, we'll see that Jesus tells us that not only was he the good shepherd, we'll see that Jesus said that he was the door to the fold as well. We'll see that said there in the seventh verse where the howling would lead the sheep to fend for themselves in the face of danger, Jesus was stating that the only way to get to his flock was through him. Do we see that there today? You see, I want you to understand something about the fold, the sheep pen back then. You see, back then, a sheep pen did not have a physical door that could be open or a physical door that could be closed. A good shepherd would block this open doorway. The good shepherd would block this open doorway with his own body. The good shepherd would lay in the doorway so that nothing could go out or so that nothing could come in to the flock. Do you see that there today, what that is? You see, I want you to understand that the shepherd was being a shield for the flock. Not only was the shepherd being a shield for the flock, but the shepherd was being a protector for the flock as well. I want you to understand today, as you graze in the field, I want you to understand that not only is Jesus the shepherd, but he is the door to you as well. He is your shield. He is your protector. He's not going to let any harm come upon you. Do you see that there today? He's not going to allow any kind of danger to come upon you. The Lord was stating that he is the protector of the flock. God was saying that he is the protector of you. Now compare that action to the action of the hireling that would run away in the face of a threat, that ran away from the wolf. Jesus said that he would be in place to protect the flock from the wolf. Jesus said that he would lay down his life for the flock in the face of this danger. You'll see it say there in the 15th verse that Jesus would, would lay down his life, that he would give his life for his sheep. Do you see the great lengths that the Lord was willing to go through for the flock? Do you see the great lengths that God was willing to go through for the flock in order to earn the flock's trust? So I must ask this question today. With God going through so much to earn your trust, with God going through so much, putting in so much work to earn your obedience today, I must ask us this question. Is God not worthy of our trust? Is the good shepherd not worthy of your obedience today? Some of us will say that he is worthy of our trust, that he is worthy of our obedience. So I, I, I must ask the question then, why are we so disobedient? Why, we, why are we so disobedient to our good shepherd? Has he not earned both of those things from us? Has he not earned our obedience? Has he not earned our trust? I would certainly hope that the Lord has earned your trust. I would certainly hope that the Lord, after putting in so much work for us, loving us, giving us his only begotten son, I would certainly hope that God has earned your trust and that God has earned your obedience.
that you will willingly follow behind, that you will willingly follow after him. The onus is now on we who are of the flock, we who are grazing in this field today, to either put our trust in the one that has truly worked for that trust or to continue to reject his efforts. The onus is on us to either choose to be obedient and follow after him or be disobedient and not follow after him. The onus is on all of you today. The onus is on me as well today. The onus is on us today. You see, I must ask, what other gods, what other idols have put in the effort, have put in the work that God has put in in order to gain your trust, in order to gain your obedience? But we willingly give our trust and our obedience over to other gods and over to idols as well. Again, Jesus declared to us that he is the good shepherd. He can declare this because he put in the effort. He can declare this because he put in the work. And because he put in the effort and because he put in the work, we as the flock who are in the field have benefits that come from all of the effort. We have benefits that come from all of the work that the good shepherd put in. With him as our shepherd, I want you to understand today that we have absolutely everything that we require to be able to live in this field and to be able to do so content in our heart, to be able to do so peacefully. See, our shepherd, he gives us food to the full, as we saw last week. Our shepherd, he gives us food to the full so that we want no more. And again, I want you to understand that when I'm talking about food here, I'm not talking about physical food. I'm talking about spiritual food for your soul. Our good shepherd, he is our shield and our protector from the wolves. He's our shield and our protector from the thieves and the robbers that that are out in the world to do one thing and one thing only to cause harm and to cause uh, a threat to come upon you. He's our shield and our protector in this world that poses nothing but danger and threats against us. In other words, our good shepherd provides us with absolutely everything that we need and we have come to know peace under him when we choose to be obedient, when we choose to trust him, when we choose to follow after him. We have come to know peace under his watchful eye. We have come to know peace under his care. This is our blessing and our great benefit to being the obedient sheep of God when we choose to obediently follow after him. As I have said in recent weeks, we have come to realize that we will be lost and scattered in this field without him, without Jesus watching over us, without Jesus keeping us, without Jesus caring for us. This will leave us wide open to those that seek to harm us, those that seek to devour us as well. This will leave us wide open to predators that come into the field that we are grazing in. I believe that we have all grown so used to having our provider, so used to having our caretaker and our protector, that we fear being in the field without his watchful eye. We fear what may happen to us while we are grazing in this field, if he is not by our side, if he is not with us. You see, again, I say to all of you today, we are a God-fearing people. We have become obedient and we draw ever closer to our good shepherd because we fear what will happen to us if we are not with him. I don't know if you feel the same way I do today, but that's how I feel. Now, not all cattle grazing in the field are obedient sheep. 
Not all cattle grazing in the field are sheep at all. You see, some of the cattle in the field are stubborn and they refuse to be led by the good shepherd. They refuse to be led by Christ. Regardless of what you may have heard about sheep, don't you understand today that sheep are not ignorant? Sheep are not stubborn animals. They are actually considered to be one of the most docile animals in the world. I want you to understand there is another type of cattle, however, that is in the field that Jesus has actually spoken of in scripture that will one day be separated from the sheep. This cattle is a bit less docile than the sheep. What I mean by that is that this cattle is a bit stubborn, a bit hard headed, if you will. I want to direct your attention to the 25th chapter of Matthew for just a moment. I just have a few verses here so that we can see this other, other cattle, this one that is stubborn, this one that is hard headed. When you get to the 25th chapter of Matthew's gospel, I want you to take a look at that 32nd, 33rd, and the 34th verse there. We'll see that Jesus said one day, say all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the what? Goats. From the what? Goats. The goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats won't be with the sheep. We'll see there. They are not going to be on his right hand. The goats are going to be on the left. Again, I tell you, we are grazing in a field today and there's much cattle in the field, the field being our world. Some of the cattle are sheep. Some of the cattle are goats. To the sheep, we see that Jesus said that because they trusted him, because they obediently followed after him, Jesus said that they will inherit the kingdom. We see that there in the 34th verse. On the other hand, if you go down to the 46th verse ver there, we'll see the stubborn goats will be told to depart from the Lord. The stubborn, hard-headed, disobedient goat will be told to go away from the Lord, not just anywhere, but into everlasting punishment is what Jesus said there. So that lesson that we learned as children when we were growing up, it pops back up again. It is better to be obedient than to be disobedient, especially when it comes to the Lord. It is better for us to be obedient than be disobedient of the Lord. You see, there are great benefits to having the Lord as your shepherd while you are in this field that is our world. But at the very same time, I want you to understand today that there are even greater benefits that extend beyond this pasture that we are currently grazing in today. First in the book of Hebrews, we'll see that the writer in the closing benediction called Jesus the great shepherd of the sheep because of the everlasting covenant made through his blood. That's in the last chapter of Hebrews. It's the benediction. So it's around the last verse as well. If you just want to turn to see it, I see people trying to turn there. Now the everlasting covenant, we should all know is a premise of an even better pasture for us who follow after the Lord, for us who follow after Christ, for all of us to graze in. Mm -hmm. Then in his first letter, Peter wrote of the good shepherd that is now the great shepherd. Peter wrote that when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. 
Jesus, I want you to understand today, is not just any old kind of shepherd. Jesus is not just the good shepherd, but he's the great shepherd. Not only is he the great shepherd, but he is the chief shepherd. There is no other shepherd that is like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As the chief shepherd, there will be a great reward to all of those who have followed after him, to all of those who have trusted him, to all of those who have been obedient to him, to all of those who have genuinely followed after him, there is a great reward of the obedient sheep of God. I want you to understand today that God is moving us. The Lord is moving every last one of us. He's moving us from this pastor to an even better pastor. And I tell you that the grass in that pastor is definitely greener. You know, they always say, is the grass greener on the other side? When it comes to this pastor, the grass is definitely greener. The grass is definitely better for us to, to graze in. God is moving us to another pastor as I speak to you today. I want you to understand that we are on a journey with the chief shepherd. And again, I tell you that it is best that we continue to follow closely behind him so that we can reach that everlasting pastor that is the Lord's kingdom. Do this, I tell you today, with great fear. Do this with great fear in your heart of what will happen to you should you fall out of line of following him. Do this with great fear of what would happen to you if you are stubborn like the goat, if you are disobedient and decide to wander your own way instead of follow after him. I say to you today, let us remain the obedient sheep of God and let us follow closely behind our good, our great, and our chief shepherd. Amen. 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 Amen.